It's Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On the show today, reports from Dan Novak and Dan Friedel. Later, Faith Perlow brings us Ask a Teacher. She'll join me in the studio after the report. And we close the show with an American story. But first... The average life expectancy of North America's largest and rarest tortoise species is unknown. But scientists say the animals could live more than 100 years. The Bolson tortoise is an endangered species. Saving it from extinction is a long-term project. But a conservation effort took a step toward that goal last week. United States wildlife officials reached an agreement with the Turner Endangered Species Fund. The deal permits the release of Bolson tortoises on land owned by Ted Turner, a media industry leader. The release of captive tortoises on the Armendaris Ranch is designed to create a free-roaming population. Last week, 20 adult tortoises were released on the property, which is already home to 23 of them. There are also many younger tortoises. The tortoises usually spend about 85% of the time in their underground burrows, which in some cases can be about 20 meters long. The animals live long lives and are slow to reproduce. Sean Sartorius is with the Fish and Wildlife Service. He said the results of the breeding and restoration project will not be seen in his lifetime. What we're doing here is establishing a population here that can be handed off to the next generation, Sartorius said. It is a step toward one day releasing the tortoises in more places in the southwest. Conservationists are also pushing the federal government to consider creating a recovery plan for the species. The tortoise is part of a growing effort to find new homes for endangered species as they flee climate change and other threats to their natural habitats. Wild Bolson tortoises are found only in the grasslands of north-central Mexico. The animal once lived in a much greater area that included the southwestern United States. Fossil records also show it was once present in the southern Great Plains, including parts of Texas and Oklahoma. Scientists estimate the wild population of Bolson tortoises in Mexico is under 2,500. Experts say the animals are hunted as food and as pets. Their habitat is shrinking as more desert grasslands become farmland. The 1,450-square-kilometer Armendaris Ranch appears to be a great area for the tortoises. In all, the Turner Endangered Species Fund and its partners have been able to grow the population from 30 tortoises to about 800, said Chris Wise. She leads the project at the Armendaris Ranch. The releases are the essential step to getting them back on the ground and letting them be wild tortoises, she said. The tortoises released last week will be able to live freely in the 6.6 hectare pen. They are given electronic trackers and wildlife workers will check on them once a year. Depending on weather and other factors, 
It can take a few years or more for a hatchling to reach just over 110 millimeters long. They can eventually grow to about 370 millimeters. The species was unknown to science until the late 1950s and has not been studied closely. The goal is to build a strong captive population that can be used as research for future releases into the wild, both in the U.S. and Mexico. That work will include getting state and federal permits to release tortoises outside Turner lands. Those recently released hit the ground crawling. They wandered through grass and around desert plants as the Fra Cristobal mountain range appeared in the distance. It was a moment that Wise and her team have been working toward for years. We are not in the business of making pets, she said. We are in the business of making wild animals, and that means you have to let them go. I'm Dan Novak. Paris Mayor on Hidalgo has long worked to make her city less dependent on cars. She wanted to see more people using bicycles or bikes to get around. Over a number of years, the city government put in restrictions on cars and increased the amount of bike lanes from 200 kilometers to over 1,000 kilometers. Now her effort seems to have paid off. This year, Parisians are not complaining about too much automobile traffic. Instead, they say there are too many bikes. Thibault Carré is a spokesperson for France's Federation of Bicycle Users. He said he remembered seeing traffic jams all over the place when he traveled by car as a child. Now it's really like a bike traffic jam, he said. It's kind of a good difficulty to have, especially when we think about what Paris used to be. Some famous roads along the River Seine are completely closed to cars. Now you see people riding bikes, running, and walking with their families along the river. In another part of Paris, a bike path on Sebastopol Boulevard is one of the busiest in Europe after opening in 2019. In one week in early September, it recorded a record high of 124,000 riders. Paris en Selle is a volunteer organization supporting cycling in the city. It says the French capital's bike paths are busier than some popular ones in London and almost as busy as some in Amsterdam. Amsterdam is known for its high bike usage. Experts say the revolution will continue. Instead of the honking of horns and pollutive gas from cars, Paris will become known for cyclists, they say. The city will host the Summer Olympics in 2024 and plans to add more bike lanes by then. Paris wants to reduce its pollution by half during the Games even as visitors from around the world will be in the city for the event. Organizers say all of the competition sites will be reachable by bike through a 60-kilometer network of bike lanes. The change to Paris, however, has not been easy. With more people using bikes, more people are making mistakes. Some of them are new to cycling and disobey traffic rules. Michel Gillernt 
rode through the Place de la Concorde in the central part of the city. Paris has become unlivable, he said. No one can stand each other. Gelernt, who is retired and in his 70s, said he often used public transportation and four higher motorized scooters, but he changed to cycling during the COVID-19 pandemic. He said he uses Paris's bike-sharing system for 80% of his trips. He still has complaints. Everyone behaves selfishly. The traffic is a lot worse than it was, he said. But the environment may be improving. Cycling is good exercise and helps reduce pollution, which is still a problem for the large city. The French government blames atmospheric pollution for 48,000 early deaths in the country each year. Hidalgo was re-elected in 2020 and plans to keep making what she calls a Paris that breathes. Her newest five-year bike plan includes over $250 million for more bike paths and bike parking. The new budget is an increase of over $100 million from her first five-year plan. I'm Dan Friedel. Hi there. This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question about the difference between a teacher, a tutor, and a lecturer. Hello, teacher. My name is Saddam, and I am from Uganda in Africa. I request your help to differentiate between three words and their deep meanings. Teacher, lecturer, and tutor. Thanks, Saddam. Thanks for this great question, Saddam. All three words are nouns used to describe educators. All three teach students in different ways and have different experiences and qualifications. Let's look at each word so we understand the differences. A teacher is a professional educator who teaches students. When we think of a teacher, we see a smaller classroom with 15 to 25 students. A teacher might teach in front of the class or go around to work with individual students. In the United States, we call those who teach students up to 12th grade teachers. They teach all subjects in elementary school, or specific subjects like math, English, or history in middle or high school. Teachers are usually required to have an advanced degree, such as a master's in education. They also must pass a certification or test in general teaching knowledge and specific subjects. Miss Leslie is a first-year elementary school teacher. She recently completed her certifications and spent many hours in a classroom helping another teacher. A lecturer or professor is an educator who teaches in colleges or universities. Lecturers often teach larger classes and stand in front of a big room. For one-on-one -on -one time with students, they meet outside the classroom during office hours. Lecturers or professors usually have an advanced degree, like a master's or Ph.D., in their subject or special field of study. Angela is an economics lecturer at a university. She has a Ph.D., but this is her first year of full-time teaching. A tutor is an educator who specializes in a certain subject or content area. Tutors usually help students one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. 
They do not need a degree. However, some professional tutors have at least a bachelor's degree. High school students can be tutors to other students if they have advanced knowledge in a subject. Tutors usually give study help to students at different times, like in the evening or on the weekends. They make lessons more personal and help students with specific problems. I have a big English test coming up, so I'm meeting with my tutor after school every day this week so I can be prepared. Please let us know if these explanations and examples have helped you, Saddam. Do you have a question about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Faith Perlow. We just heard this week's Ask a Teacher. Welcome back to the show, Faith. This week, you answered a question about the difference between teacher, lecturer, and tutor. One thing I noticed was that you did not include instructor. Is that word similar to teacher or lecturer? Great question, Katie. An instructor is also someone who teaches students. But an instructor is more like a lecturer than an elementary or high school teacher. Instructors teach at the college level and may specialize in a certain subject. Unlike lecturers, though, instructors may teach smaller class sizes at a university. Since they teach those smaller class sizes, they can use teaching techniques that high school teachers might use, like group work or student participation. Well, thanks for your instruction today, Faith. Of course, Katie. Our story today is called Luck. It was written by Mark Twain. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. I was at a dinner in London given in honor of one of the most celebrated English military men of his time. I do not want to tell you his real name and titles. I will just call him Lieutenant General Lord Arthur Scoresby. I cannot describe my excitement when I saw this great and famous man. There he sat, the man himself in person, all covered with medals. I could not take my eyes off him. He seemed to show the true mark of greatness. His fame had no effect on him. The hundreds of eyes watching him, the worship of so many people, did not seem to make any difference to him. Next to me sat a clergyman, who was an old friend of mine. He was not always a clergyman. During the first half of his life, he was a teacher in the military school at Woolwich. There was a strange look in his eye as he leaned toward me and whispered, Privately, he is a complete fool. He meant, of course, the hero of our dinner. This came as a shock to me. I looked hard at my friend. I could not have been more surprised if he had said the same thing about Napoleon or Socrates or Solomon. But I was sure of two things about the clergyman. He always spoke the truth, and his judgment of men was good. Therefore, I wanted to find out more about our hero as soon as I could. Some days later, I got a chance to talk with the clergyman, and he told me more. These are his exact words. About forty years ago, 
I was an instructor in the military academy at Woolwich when young Scoresby was given his first examination. I felt extremely sorry for him. Everybody answered the questions, well, intelligently, while he, why, dear me, he did not know anything, so to speak. He was a nice, pleasant young man. It was painful to see him stand there and give answers that were miracles of stupidity. I knew, of course, that when examined again, he would fail and be thrown out. So, I said to myself, it would be a simple, harmless act to help him as much as I could. I took him aside and found he knew a little about Julius Caesar's history, but he did not know anything else. So I went to work and tested him and worked him like a slave. I made him work over and over again on a few questions about Caesar, which I knew he would be asked. If you will believe me, he came through very well on the day of the examination. He got high praise, too, while others who knew a thousand times more than he were sharply criticized. By some strange, lucky accident, he was asked no questions but those I made him study. Such an accident does not happen more than once in an hundred years. Well, all through his studies, I stood by him with the feeling a mother has for a disabled child. And he always saved himself by some miracle. I thought that what in the end would destroy him would be the mathematics examination. I decided to make his end as painless as possible. So I pushed facts into his stupid head for hours. Finally, I let him go to the examination to experience what I was sure would be his dismissal from school. Well, sir, try to imagine the result. I was shocked out of my mind. He took first prize, and he got the highest praise. I felt guilty day and night. What I was doing was not right, but I only wanted to make his dismissal a little less painful for him. I never dreamed it would lead to such strange laughable results. I thought that sooner or later one thing was sure to happen. The first real test, once he was through school, would ruin him. Then the Crimean War broke out. I felt that sad for him that there had to be a war. Peace would have given this donkey a chance to escape from ever being found out as being so stupid. Nervously, I waited for the worst to happen. It did. He was appointed an officer, a captain of all things, who could have dreamed that they would place such a responsibility on such weak shoulders as his. I said to myself that I was responsible to the country for this. I must go with him and protect the nation against him as far as I could. So I joined up with him, and away we went to the field. And there, oh dear, it was terrible. Mistakes. Fearful mistakes. Why, he never did anything that was right. Nothing but mistakes. But you see, nobody knew the secret of how stupid he really was. Everybody misunderstood his 
actions. They saw his stupid mistakes as works of great intelligence. They did, honestly. His smallest mistakes made a man in his right mind cry and shout and scream, too. To himself, of course. And what kept me in a continual fear was the fact that every mistake he made increased his glory and fame. I kept saying to myself that when at last they find out about him, it will be like the sun falling out of the sky. <sighs> he continued to climb up over the dead bodies of his superiors. Then, in the hottest moment of one battle, down went our colonel. My heart jumped into my mouth, for Scoresby was the next in line to take his place. Now we are in for it, I said. The battle grew hotter. The English and their allies were steadily retreating all over the field. Our regiment occupied a position that was extremely important. One mistake now would bring total disaster. And what did Scoresby do this time? He just mistook his left hand for his right hand. That was all. An order came for him to fall back and support our right Instead, he moved forward and went over the hill to the left. We were over the hill before this insane movement could be discovered and stopped. And what did we find? A large and unsuspected Russian army waiting. And what happened? Were we all killed? That is exactly what would have happened in 99 cases out of a 100. But no, those surprised Russians thought that no one regiment by itself would come around there at such a time. It must be the whole British army, they thought. They turned tail. Away they went over the hill and down into the field in wild disorder, and we after them. In no time there was the greatest turnaround you ever saw. The Allies turned defeat into a sweeping and shining victory. The Allied commander looked on, his head spinning with wonder, surprise, and joy. He sent right off for Scoresby and put his arms around him and hugged him on the field in front of all the armies. Scoresby became famous that day as a great military leader, honored throughout the world. That honor will never disappear while history books last. He is just as nice and pleasant as ever, but he still does not know enough to come in out of the rain. He is the stupidest man in the universe. Until now, nobody knew it but Scoresby and myself. He has been followed day by day, year by year, by a strange luck. He has been a shining soldier in all our wars for years. He has filled his whole military life with mistakes. Every one of them brought him another honorary title. Look at his chest flooded with British and foreign medals. Well, sir, every one of them is the record of some great stupidity or other. They are proof that the best thing that can happen to a man is to be born lucky. I say again, as I did at the dinner, Scoresby's a complete fool. 
That's all the time we have for today's show, but join us again tomorrow for another VOA Learning English program. Thanks for listening. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel.